Hey everybody, Tommy here for a fun one because it is road trip day with the brand new Ford Bronco. Me and my buddy Kira, we are heading out into the Rocky Mountains for the perfect two day Denver trip. All right, so we are starting here in our hometown of Boulder, Colorado, which is only like a 45 minute drive from Denver International. It's a great place to visit. We got great food, great restaurants, a really cool little downtown. Um, but of course we live here, so it wouldn't be much of a vacation. So we're gonna head up to Steamboat Springs, which is about three and a half hours from here. It's a fantastic ski town, lots of history. Along the way, we'll show you some of the really great spots. And then we're gonna hit some national monuments, some national parks, because that's what Kira and I do. We're big national monument and park people. We got these little passports we gotta fill out. So let's hit the road, head up the canyon, we'll take the scenic drive and um, just make some miles. Camera woman Kira, killing it. So we are heading up, we're taking a little detour actually. We're going up a road called Lick Skillet Road, which is an absolutely goofy name. But this is, and I kid you not, you can look it up on Wikipedia, so it has to be true, the steepest county road in all of the US. It is a maintained road, it's dirt, but it is the steepest county road anywhere in the US. You say it twice, it sounds more believable. But, but for reality, it's true. Now the Bronco's gonna have no problem. We're gonna stick it in a four-wheel drive and just cruise right on up. But um, in the winter especially, this road becomes super, super, super dangerous. And um, when I was like 13, I was out here with my dad in a tundra and almost slid into a tree because we uh, thought we were smarter than the road grader. Anyways, at the top of this road is a little town called Gold Hill, Colorado, which is one of the very last authentic Colorado mountain towns. So many have turned into like ski resorts and fancy, um, you know, hotel towns, which is fine. But this is a down home, rustic little town. And there's a fantastic general store uh, with the best pies in Colorado. So uh, we're going to climb up Lick Skillet and then uh, keep cruising up on our way toward the Rocky Mountains. So Kira is making me listen to a song called Watermelon Crawl. Hold just for a sec. This is the is this a song that you young whippersnappers listen to? It's about, what is this song about? It's about watermelons? But it's a horrible song, Kira. Life's hard, man. <laughs> also, only people who say whippersnapper would listen to this song, so it's perfect for you. So Kira and I have made it down the peak to peak highway to a place called Blackhawk in Central City. And these used to be big mining towns back in like the late 19th century, early 20th century. And now they are known for pretty much one thing, which is gambling. This is where everybody goes in Colorado to gamble. There's casinos and stuff here. And it's like a weird dichotomy because half of it's very vintage and cool. Um, a quarter of it is um, new that looks vintage. And then a Another quarter of it is just mini Vegas. Uh, and it's also known for clogging everything up because they have these bus full of people that they bus up from Denver to go to the casino to do their thing and then bus back and the buses go slowly. Anyways, I, you can skip Black Hawk in Central City um, and zoom on up to Parking Ridge and Keystone in that area where we're going to have lunch a little bit later. Silverthorne, Colorado, and we are near the ski areas here. We've got Keystone, Breckenridge, a basin, all within like a 30 minute drive. We're gonna get some lunch at this new trendy place called Bluebird Market. It's okay, it's one of these places where like you choose your restaurant and then eat in the middle. All right, well, lunch is over. We had crepes and tacos. So now we're gonna head to Breckenridge, which is a really cool little ski town, and it's got a really nice little downtown area, and check out what's out there. As a young girl, it feels we're mine. We played hide and seek for hours, raised our shadows among the pines. So offshore, play full and free, without a care in the world. I was one rich little girl. Daydream. All right, so we just got done at Breckenridge, which is this really cool little. Um basically ski town now we are here like the middle of May this is called mud season so some of the stores are closed but everything is also much cheaper than in the winter of the summer because this is like the area between ski season and like hiking season now we're on our way to steamboat along this beautiful road but we had to stop and get snacks so let me show you uh, my go-to snack food thank you Kira so first up we've got 
the True Moo whole milk, chocolate milk, of course. Um, this is a Red Bull. I've never actually had a Red Bull, but I'm trying to get adventurous today. Pringles, my go-to uh, uh, salty snack. Excellent. Now, they didn't have the right Sour Patch Kids, so I got these, kind of a, a sad substitute. And then, highly underrated snack food, I present to you the Tootsie Pop. All right, Kira, put, put your snacks on your side. All right. This, I can't find it anywhere else in Colorado, but they had it at the middle of nowhere gas station, and I'm thrilled. <laughs> Gummy worms are always a must. Okay, and yep. Because there was a sale, I also had to get the peach rings. All right, so vote in the comments who did the snacks better. I'm a big snack person, clearly. Um, but it's such a nice day. Do you want to take the top down for the rest of our drive? Sounds great. Now this is our brand new and very exciting addition to the Ford Bronco. We've gone back to a hard top. This is the new MIC 2.0. It took several months to come in. Um, and this is the one that doesn't rattle. And then we added a best top Sunrider on here so we can get fun in the sun in a matter of a couple of seconds. So we're coming down Rabbit Ears Pass toward Steamboat, Colorado, and the views out here are just amazing. It's like 56, 58 degrees Fahrenheit, but look at this view. And that probably looks like nothing on camera, <laughs> but it's pretty cool in person. Um, and one of the nice things about Steamboat, so if you look at like Vail, Breckenridge, uh, the go-to ski resort towns in Colorado, they're all at like 9, 10,000 feet. And then if you're coming from sea level, it can be kind of hard to breathe. Even if you're coming from Denver, at 5,000 feet, it can be kind of hard to breathe. But Steamboat's unusual where you get the mountain town feel, the mountain town look, but then it's like, I don't know, five, 6,000 feet above sea level. So it really isn't all that high. So it's, uh, it's nice for if you're accustomed to sea level, you're not gonna be out of breath all of the time. We made it to these waterfalls, which look very cool. But of course, we bought the totally wrong footwear. And I'm now realizing you probably can't hear any of this. Anyway, they're called Rainbow Rainbow Falls. Rain, I'm going with it. And they're very, very nice, but bring the right footwear. Just kidding, they're called Fish Creek Falls, not Rainbow Falls whatsoever. All right, so we're out here in Steamboat. It's Mark, right? Yes, sir. Just ran into me. Hey, nice buddy. To meet you. How's it going? I'm good. Good. So, what do you drive? Uh, two FJ Cruisers, 2012 and 2007. Two of them. Yep. Why do you have two of them? Uh, one's my beater dog car, and the other one is my nice one. So, so. do you do you off road in the? Oh uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. The 07, 35 inch tires, just like the Bronco here, and uh, goes anywhere. So, Sweet. well, what do you think of the Bronco? Do you like oh, it? Oh, I love it, man. The color's awesome. Matches everything. Looks good. Yeah, it looks it's good. pretty fun. And it's actually, one thing I will say, this is my first time road tripping and yeah. it's a really good road trip. Oh yeah, yeah, man, it looks, looks beautiful. How's the mileage on it? 18.9. That ain't bad. It's not that bad. bad at all. All right, well, kind of a weird cut, but it's the next morning. My apologies, the GoPro battery died, but we went for that great hike up to this amazing waterfall, and then we went into Steamboat and kind of checked out what Steamboat has to offer, and I definitely recommend going out to Steamboat if you are in the Colorado area for a couple of days. It is pretty far from Denver, like three, three and a half hours, but it's a beautiful little town, great little downtown area with um, good restaurants, amazing shops, and there's biking and hiking and skiing in the winter. Now this is one of those places that's also pretty bougie and expensive, especially in the winter, but if you come in like late May, early June, we stayed at this Homewood Suite with a little kitchen and a, a fridge and you know, small apartment stuff for like 130 bucks a night, so really pretty reasonable, but now it's a, uh, about 8.30, we are going to hit the road to Dinosaur National Monument, which is two, two and a half hours away from here, uh, and see what that has to offer. It's kind of remote in this part of Colorado, not super remote, but certainly good distance between gas stations. So we're gonna fill up the Bronco and then make our way up to Dinosaur National, National Monument, I think. I don't think it's a park. Yeesh, $4.70. Pretty pricey, but on this first tank, getting from Boulder to Steamboat, uh, 220 something miles, almost 230 miles, and we've been averaging 19 according to the computer, which is pretty good for a vehicle on 35 inch tall tires. All the way out to 
Dinosaur National Monument and it was a pretty remote drive so definitely re recommend filling up ahead of time and uh, there's pretty much no one here so we're gonna go poke around and see if we can see some dinos. Alright, well we did get a little screwed on this one, so uh, this is a huge national monument. It spans many, 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 many miles, um, and it's in Colorado and Utah. Now we are on the Colorado side, and we just drove like two and a half hours here from Steamboat, but apparently this visitor center is closed for the season, and it reopens in spring, late spring of 2022, and it's May 20th, I think that's kind of the definition of late spring. But anyways, we're going to go another 30 miles that way and see if the Utah one is open. And apparently that's where the dinosaurs are. So on our search across national parks, we have these things. Check this out. These are the official passport to your national parks. And then you get these stamps whenever you uh, go to these national parks like that. That's what they look like. And they're pretty cool to collect. So Dinosaur National Monument, actually a really cool spot to visit. Really, really enjoyed it. So um, in 1909, well, I guess we got to go back a little further. 65 million years ago, the last dinosaur went extinct and they believe that there were a lot of dinosaurs in this region um, because of the Green River. Well, a lot of them washed up in this area. They believe as they died, they fall in the river and then the river would push them against the, the, the cliffs. Is that right? Yep. All right, cool. Got that right. Um, and then in 1909, this guy named Douglas Morrison uh, discovered the first dinosaurs in this area. Where Aaron was Douglas. it? Earl Douglas? Earl Douglas. Darn it. Earl Douglas discovered the first dinosaurs in this area. And then they excavated between, between 1909 and 1924. And then he said that this should be like a place for visitors to come check it out. Um, and then what they did is it became a national monument. And then they half excavated this one area. <clears throat> so what they ended up doing is half excavating this one hillside so you could see this tremendous number of dinosaurs. They entombed it in this very cool modernist style building in the 1950s um, and then it started to fall down so they had to kind of rebuild it and strengthen it and now it's a national historic monument but it's a great place to go and learn about dinosaurs you can see real life dinosaur bones you can touch them even which is cool and overall a winner of a spot when you say Kira yes sir <laughs> On the way back from the National Monument, we cruise along these like very, very desolate Utah and Colorado roads. And I keep seeing these little like spurs for dirt roads that just go in every which direction. And I've always wanted to explore one, so we just pulled off and took this one. And it's marked on the map, it's called Davis Spring Road, but there's literally nothing out here. Um, and that's a really cool feeling, and that's one of the advantages of road tripping in the Ford Bronco, right? Like, you could probably do this in a RAV4 or a Super Outback. There's a couple of places where you might run into clearance issues, but when you are this far from anything and completely out of cell service, it's great to have a vehicle that you know has the capability if things get rough and ready really quickly. And, of course, this Bronco has plenty of it. Now, it's also fun to kind of get away from the rules and the regulations, and you can really blast down these service roads, uh, stick it in Baja mode, and get some speed going, which is fun too. It's just nice to be so far away from everybody and everything and all the laws and, you know, the usual stuff that you're worried about on a daily basis. Kira's laughing at me because we're going like 24 miles an hour. But the point is, that's the best part about road tripping in the Bronco is you see a direction you want to go and you just go whoop and take it. And there's a good chance that especially if you're in one like this one with the Sasquatch package, anything the world can throw at you, you can probably take it. <music> are 
on Interstate 70. Now going to the Dinosaur National Monument, we went up through Steamboat and then went left and then coming back down, we took a slightly different way, went through the heart of Western Colorado, which I've never done before, and then down to 70. Now we're cruising back towards Denver. We're probably gonna spend the night in Keystone, Colorado. Um, but we're coming up with something kind of fun, which is a, a unique aspect of this job. Up here in the high country of Colorado, of course, uh, we've got elevations of 10, 12, 13,000 feet, and car manufacturers want to test to make sure that their future products are going to work up here. So what they do is they take their new future models and then they camouflage them so that the uh, public doesn't know what they are, and then we come up here and chase them. So here, if you want to turn the camera out the windshield, we'll see that now. So obviously we got the standard Ram, and then we've got these weird looking cars, which have got funky taillights and this dazzle paint job. Um, and they probably will have manufacturer plates, and we'll see what, uh, what state. Michigan. Sweet, look at that. What is that? <laughs> sure what that is. Oh, Chevy of some kind. Yeah, the grill says Chevy for sure. Although sometimes they camouflage the grills too with other manufacturer designs. Uh, but I'm thinking that this is some kind of new compact Chevy. Maybe like a new Equinox or new Trax. Looks to be gasoline because it's got a muffler. Although sometimes that is camouflage too. But yeah, look at that. That's pretty cool. Well, we made it to Keystone and I wanted to stop here for a quick second and talk about some of the pros and some of the cons about the Ford Bronco as a road tripper because this is really my first road trip in this vehicle uh, and 650 some miles in I have learned a lot and the big takeaway is this thing is a freaking awesome road trip vehicle genuinely blown away in pretty much every aspect about how well the Ford Bronco has done on this road trip. I'm just floored by it. It's awesome, 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 awesome. Now, in my opinion, the best road trip vehicles, hands down, full-size pickup truck, half tons. You've got a lot of room. You sit nice and tall. You feel like you've got a commanding view of the road, and the Bronco has all of that and more. This thing has blown away my expectations. Now, I've done a ton of road trips in these kind of dedicated off-road SUVs, so like 4Runners, um, FJ Cruisers, uh, Wranglers and so many Wrangler road trips and I was kind of expecting a similar experience in the Bronco because of course the top can come off the doors can come off but this is like 9,000 steps above a Wrangler as a road tripper it's just phenomenal love it love it love it let's talk about some of the things I've learned so first of all the size now I have give the Bronco some criticism in the past about the size because yes it is quite wide and sometimes on some of these really narrow Colorado trails in between the trees it is hard to fit down some paths but on a road trip when you're cruising for 13 and a half hours as we have done in the last day um, there is just nothing better the space that this vehicle offers from a width standpoint is awesome so Kira's been sitting here the whole time and I have plenty of space between um, myself and my passenger. So in a Wrangler, this space here between the seats is sometimes a little tight and you feel like you're shoulder to shoulder, but not in the Bronco. And then the height, the height is immense in this vehicle. Sitting uh, in this Bronco with 35 inch tall tires just looking over traffic has been phenomenal. Really, really, really gives you a commanding view of the road. And then we come to the seats, the seats blow the Wrangler out of the water, blow the Forerunner out of the water. These have been awesome. Now this of course is the first edition with this Navy Pier um, leather interior. And on the driver's side, we have a full power uh, front and uh, uh, of course recline along with lumbar. Sorry, it's a little dirty here. This is full road trip mode, um, but the seats are really, really good. And I'm six feet tall in a Wrangler. I can't quite get the seat back far enough in the Bronco, stick it all the way back and it's just great. So much room, so much headroom. And it's actually been quieter than I was expecting. Now we do have this best top Sunrider, um, which makes a little bit of noise compared to the full hard top, but it, it's very manageable and it was nice in that nice sunny day yesterday to flick it back and kind of enjoy that open, uh, open aspect. Now, from a technology and then a driver assistance standpoint, 
the Wild Zelda Carplay has been working fantastic. Kira is an absolute wizard when it comes to playlists. She's been uh, hooked up to Wild Zelda Carplay the entire time, but the nice thing is we still have access to like a little navigation thing here, which is really, really handy. And there's all sorts of different panels that you can kind of uh, uh, navigate between. So we've been doing that. Wild Zelda Carplay has been working perfectly not a hitch the entire trip now let's see some of that trip info whoa um go down into trip two so 660 miles traveled averaging 19.3 mpg which is really pretty good when you consider this thing is rolling on 35 inch tall tires so driver assistance this is actually the very first road trip i've ever taken in a vehicle with adaptive cruise control for some reason whenever i'm taking road trips it's always in weird old stuff or new stuff that doesn't have adaptive cruise but this has been an absolute game changer for uh, comfort on long stretches when you come up to traffic it slows down nicely i find that one click of adaptive cruise is actually too close of a following distance i like to do two clicks that's a nice distance still prevents people from jumping out in front of you um, and then we also have been using the lane keep assist. Now this is not lane centering, so uh, it kind of just vibrates if you approach the lane lines. I wish it did have lane centering. I mean, now I'm getting a little bougie, but uh, it would be cool to just have kind of a uh, keep a hand of steering. We'll have the car do a lot of the driving for you. And I think the technology is there. They just need to implement it. But um, adaptive cruise control has been perfect. Now, uh, some things I'm not a big fan of. There are one or two things. Uh, first of all, Man, I'm, I really gotta think. Oh, here we go. That's right. The audio system is not incredible. It's good. It's quite good, but it it does lack some uh, kind of crisp. Nah, crispness is not the right word. Depth is the right word. So this does have the B and O sound system, but you've got speakers in the front. Then you've got this huge chasm before you got speakers way in the back, and it's just very front heavy, so you don't get a lot of feedback from the speakers in the back. Uh, it sounds pretty good. Like I said, uh, unless you are really an audiophile, it'll probably be okay, but I really do love um, the depth that you get from speakers in a premium audio system, and that's kind of lacking in the Bronco. And then a wireless charger is not very good. So it's currently being used as my Andes Mints holder. Um, with my iPhone, what is this, 12 or 13? Uh, it, it gets really hot, but it doesn't charge very quickly and it kind of slides around and then I have to pick it up and reset it in order for it to uh, make contact again and start charging. But apart from that, it's been an absolute road trip beast. The climate control is amazing. Cubbies and cup holders, these nets have been quite handy. There's that Red Bull, which I was uh, too weenie to actually try. <laughs> That's still hanging out in there. We got the two main ones here. Um, very good cubbies and cup holders. Haven't really dropped too much down in between the seats. That's one of my big pet peeves. Lights are incredible. Uh, only other thing I don't like, in some of the really twisty canyons, it does get a little wallowy, but that is any vehicle on 35s. But genuinely, guys, blown away by the road trip capability of the Bronco. I can't wait to do more, actually. This thing is gonna probably be my, no, my new go-to road tripper because, um, yes, it's not the most efficient in the world compared to like a car, but the fact that you can go anywhere at any time with the Bronco makes it so much fun. And then there's just two of us. We haven't really been pushing the uh, storage capacity, but there's plenty of that as well. All right, well, that was an amazing night in Keystone. Top tip, Airbnbs are, of course, cheap this time of year. I feel like a broken record, but it's true. However, a lot of restaurants are closed. And look at this weather. This is why they're cheap, because some days are nice, and some days we get this snow sleety thing in May. And that's exactly what's gone on today. Now, the trip is pretty much over. We only have like 20 miles to go back into Boulder, and the Ford Bronco has performed beautifully. 777.7 miles driven, averaging 19.7 mpg. Range, by the way about 330 miles per tank full. Uh, but 19.7 according to the computer is pretty darn impressive. Well guys, thank you for joining us on this fun Colorado road trip in the Ford Bronco. We'll see you on the next video.